what ignited your passion for cars? Whew. Um, I think my passion for cars came from a very young age. And, mm. and a lot of that was actually from uh, my dad being in the uh, second-hand car trade um, and always bringing over a different car all the time and just having a fascination with the, the shape of them and what they were and the model yeah. and the make. Um, but at that point, nothing to do with motor racing whatsoever, just a fascination for cars. Like I'd be driving along a you know, back seat and I could – point out a mile away what the rear lights were on the car in the dark because I knew every car that was on the road so yeah can't do that these days but I could back then yeah I can certainly I, I see your point because when I was that young as well you get fixated you get obsessed with these things and I was like the guy too, the headlights coming the way on the, on the motorway and you can kind of test it Volvo is it an Audi what sort of stuff um, but yeah I mean, obviously having cars coming out of your life constantly did you just see them as like a um, I guess just a daily thing got used to them sort of coming in and out and changing you know perspective on them as well um, I just you know, it's just a norm because yeah. when you're sort of in a, a, a garage environment and, uh, you know, you, your dad's in the business, so to speak, and like, you know, the business is different cars every day. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're quite lucky because in a way, like, you know, it could be anything from a, a, a Vauxhall Viva, which you would have no idea what that is, but... Um, I've seen a few. <laughs> yeah, or, or, a, or an Anglia van, you know, all yeah. the way up to a you know, a, a Rolls Royce Silver Shadow or something, because mm. you used to sort of, you know, deal in, in, in anything. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, just the fascination came from there and, and cars were the norm, so mm. to speak. So, yeah, um, the passion for driving them still came at a young age as well. So, yeah. um, on private land, I hasten to add, just in case anyone gets any <laughs> ideas, uh, I started sort of sitting on cushions, propped up and looking over the steering wheel at eight years old. So, that really was where the uh, the fascination of driving a car came from. Again, not racing them, just just driving them. Just having those, like, I guess, a, a tool, that's early freedom, I guess, isn't it? It's the early sort of like, you know, take yourself where you want to go as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from a point of view of actually saying, you know, like, there's something at a young age that I could do, um, and whether or not that was, even at that point in my mm. life, telling me that academically I wasn't going to be that strong. Yeah. Um, but, you know, doing something where I could connect with putting an input and getting an output and, and that was at the steering wheel of a car uh, yeah it was uh, it was quite fascinating so yeah yeah because it's it's something that I guess because for me again I, I wasn't very academic either in fact I'm dyslexic like yourself yep. and so I found go-karting that input output actually stuff was the only thing that really focused my brain it was the kind of thing that took I guess what I thought I was good at and actually I excelled at whereas you, you know you spend time at school and they tell you you know you're not good at exams you need to try harder stuff like this and actually well oh you know we're applying ourselves it's just not actually you know, we're not getting to the thing they want and actually it can be a bit you know it can be disheartening at times yeah I mean dyslexia is is um, kind of something that people don't fully understand unless mm. you've kind of got it um, yeah. and, and at that point you know I think if you have got dyslexia you need to use it the way where it's you know, a really big tool in the toolbox. Exactly, yeah. Um, and for me, it's, you know, and even race-wise, it's been like something that I've used to think outside the box because mm. I think that's what dyslexia makes you do. It makes you think outside the box. Maybe because you can't actually focus what's inside the box, so you've got to go outside and look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and even in today's world where motor racing isn't, my day job anymore but even sitting behind a, a computer screen you know has its limitations for me so there's, there's quite a few things that I have to do maybe time and time again to get it right yeah which is a bit time consuming but um, I'm quite lucky now my my PA's been with me 14 years so she pretty much understands when I write something even though it looks like a load of gobbledygook <laughs> And yeah, because you're used to you know, the, the disparage of words that kind of makes up the page. But um, Mark, when did you go and realise that you know I, I like this driving thing? Maybe I want to try going faster and faster and faster. And when did the most work has come into it as well? So that came later on uh, when I was still at school, mm. um, but not on four wheels, on two. Um, and because I was sort of lived in a rural area at that point in my life, the uh, the sort of local sport used to be like motorbikes going down the, a lane. <laughs> Um, and the, the guys all getting together and sort of racing each other. But actually yeah. turned out that a couple of the guys were doing what they call motocross, like schoolboy scrambling. Yeah. Um, and I kind of got a bit of a bug for that and started, I think I was 13, 14 years old on a 125cc two-stroke oh, wow, motocross okay. bike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and 
and kind of like took to it like ducks water and was quite good at it from an early stage and got into the point of uh, being top 36 ACU schoolboy rider in the UK. Um, and could have maybe gone like another step if I'd have wanted to, but um, it kind of like overlapped with, again, that sort of garage environment and my dad being in that side of the business. Um, and a, an actual friend of his taking me to a, a motor race, um, which I think at that point was a Snetterton, so again, like East Anglia, and, and getting the bug for like seeing these racing cars go around. I had no idea that motor racing even existed. Yeah. Um, you know, no relation to what was on the road that was going to be raced on the track on a Sunday. And that's really where it came from. So the two wheels quickly transformed into four wheels. And that was in 1984, driving a Formula Ford 1600, um, which in my day then was the entry level in single seater motor racing. Yeah, and so I guess well, I guess most well, most likely is single seater if you want to look at it <laughs> as well. Um, but why didn't you? I guess not, not push back. But why did you not want to pursue the, the motorcycle more? Was it not sort of as you know, exciting or? Um, no, I mean, listen. I think that the motorbikes was fantastic, and it's still a big passion of mine even today. So you know, I still watch Supercross from the states on a Sunday morning when it's been run on you know Saturday night in California or something. So um, you know, hugely. Uh, sort of passionate about it. But I think for me, like the four wheel side was always there from an early age. Mm. So actually sort of gravitating towards like four wheels and racing kind of came naturally. Um, and the opportunity really came about when, you know, I got, I didn't do karting, but my, my dad got me a, uh, it wasn't even a fun cart. It was like a, a replica of a, like a short oval, uh, little midget car in, in the USA. Oh, is that banger racing was it close no, to that? More no, more like no. a, I mean, it sounds kind of stupid, but like, if you took like a van wall from back in its day, like with that shape, yeah. um, it was like a replica of that, of which I still have today. Um, okay, well, yeah. I, it's been outside of, uh, of our, my ownership and I managed to buy it back again, but um, that was the first time I kind of got in something with four wheels and I was driving it around the forecourt of the garage. So that was the first sort of uh, taste of it, but, as I say, 1984 was the year that I actually got into a full-blown race car. It was a Formula 4 1600, so very small in power and small race car in itself. Um, and that's where the uh, the next step of the career path sort of started. Yeah, I guess it's, but you know, at this time, you know, sort of, I guess, tut- like tutoring you in, in racing, you being coached by it's always used to you figuring out what you can do with four wheels as well as... Um, so what we did, we went to... We went to... Uh, I think it, I can't remember where it was. I think it was Alexandra Palace back then. It was like the like we'd have the auto sports show these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like that, but I don't know what it was even called back then. Um, and we went to go and, and visit and was talking to people about okay, what 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 do we do? I think actually all we'd heard about was like Formula Three. So like mm-hmm. you know, we went to the show and people said, "Oh no, you can't go there. That's way too advanced." Um, you got to start in Formula 4 1600 and then work your way up. Fortunately for us, we had a manufacturer not far away in, yeah. in Lola Cars, um, only 20, 25 minutes away, which is great because we needed plenty of spares because I damaged lots of cars. <laughs> um, but um, that was kind of like the, uh, the the stepping stone there. But I, so I think um, what we did, we went to a race school Uh and jumped into a car with somebody who had quite a bit of, uh, mm. of like hours under his belt and, and was an established race driver. And he kind of said to me, look, you know, I've, I've already seen what I can see and I've been out on the track with you and I think you've got some potential. So now you need to go and actually get yourself into a racing environment and see whether that potential can actually come to be a, a reality. And, and that's really what we did. Um, and 84 was for us, it was a busy year because we took the view that we were doing motocross previously. Yeah. You did four races in one day. Oh, okay. And then we arrived at a race circuit and there was like three Formula Ford races, but many people do one of them. And they're only like 10 laps at a time. So we were like, well, it's only like some fuel, an entry, and maybe a bit more, you know, in terms of tyre consumption, in terms of wear. Why don't we do all chlorine and get some mileage under our belt and learn as quick as possible? And that was a kind of a... The, the stage that we took to, to go forward. And at that point, then people started to catch on and do do that as well. So I think you know, the grids increased quite healthily at that point. I mm. think everyone was happy. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say, yeah, um, 
a lot of races, uh, a lot of crashes, learning in the first year, a lot of success as well. Um, we won, what did we win? We won something called the Golden Helmet Award, which was a, an award back then for the most wins of any British Commonwealth driver across the season. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and I won what was called then the Grovewood Award, which was now called the Autosport Award. Um, okay. And yeah. I think I got £5,000 as a, as a, as a prize. I think, what did they get now? 250000 In excess, yeah. I think the yeah. last one was Aston Martin and he got like a 250 k yeah. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, so I got five grand and, uh, and a clap. And, uh, <laughs> five grand and a clap, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the guys get 250 in the Formula 1 test these days. So, yeah, it shows, shows your progress. It does, yeah. 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 Oh, that's incredible because you're going from, again, like a complete different discipline in motorsport to, you know, throwing yourself into these four wheelers. Again, you're taking that... I guess motocross mindset into going, well, why, why do you want a race when you can do three? Why do, you know, why you spend least time, like, like seat time and actually do more? And that seems to be like, for instance, your whole, whole across your whole career, you've had a lot of seat time. I think that's something you've taken seriously. Or? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think also I've never been scared of like taking an unorthodox route. Mm. You know, so like, and yes, there's been other guys, Damon Hill, for example, came from bikes in yeah. really starting karting like me. So, you know, it has been done. Um, but I think we've always taken the view that, like, yeah, seat time is almost like you can't substitute it. So, you got, you know, if you can get as much of it, great. Uh, adaptability. And I think, you know, if it hasn't been the right thing to do because we haven't had the right level of budget, yeah, then let's try and do something a little bit outside the box again. Um, you know, like if I look halfway through my sort of learning part of the career and we didn't have enough budget to go and do Formula 3 properly and we knew we couldn't get into a great team so performance would be a little bit you know marginalised so we jumped straight from Formula 4 2000 to F3000 oh, wow. and yeah. everyone was like oh, you can't do that you're missing out this really important part <clears throat> and they're like well needs must you know we've got enough money to get an old car a year old car and we can cobble together our own team to make this happen I can go and learn some international circuits um and, and that's really what we did. And, and actually, we uh, we surprised a lot of people. So, um, you know, it, I, again, it's, it's not been something that's ever been a barrier for me. Um, I was no different to a few of the guys, even the greats like Michael Schumacher, where we went to sports cars before we came to Formula 1. Mm. So, yeah, roadmap's one thing, but sometimes you have to deviate. I guess it's the thing that people, I guess, won't see nowadays because I'm, I know like racing drivers for instance in social media it's all like I'm here I'm, I'm here this track I'm at this track people don't see the side of it like you know having to deal with how do we get to Italy how do we get to France you know or, or can we actually do this racing series is there another thing we can get involved in and that's something like something I'm, I'm quite passionate about is showing the other ways of doing it and that your this way story resonates so much with what I'm trying to do is that you're not gone straight from you know Formula 4 to you know F2 to F3 to F2 and then to F1 you've actually you've taken your own route and so when did like the F1 kind of you know become a thing you thought actually I want to give this a go I've got a shot I've got a chance um, I mean listen there's no handbook so there's no right and wrong yeah. uh, but uh, so I started 1984 and by 1989 I was sitting in a Williams Formula 1 car doing straight line testing that yeah. was my first experience of an F1 car so you know Back in that those days, a very short time frame to get into a Formula One car from from only just start, starting out. Um, I think more than anything, it's just like performance and results lead you down the pathway, and every time the opportunity comes along, you've got to try and max, maximize it. You know, sometimes mm. opportunities came along that maybe I didn't make the most of sometimes they didn't happen quite in the way I wanted because face didn't fit or name didn't have an O or an I on the end so it didn't sound as sexy as the Italians or the Brazilians or you know there was certain things that you know budget wise we don't fit there because you're not from you know that part of the world so that's not going to fit with where our sponsorship's coming from interesting um, but you know you have, you have to just keep pushing ahead so the F1 opportunity really came from off the back of doing F3000 even like I said, like when I came in and sort of beat some well-known names with some big teams and machinery and some big sponsorship, I think it's sat a few people up to say, who's this kid, you know, what's mm. he doing? Um, and then also going across to sports cars and, uh, again, doing something there. I was with Nissan, so I was already in a factory team. Um, and, and when I got into a Formula 1 car, I was able to produce some quite 
good results in terms of testing capability, yeah. feedback, developing a car, you know, absorbing all the understanding of what's going on and relaying it back to the engineers in a way what they could understand as well. And ultimately doing a, a lap time that registered on the stopwatch and kind of like, okay, yeah, okay, that's that's pretty good. Relative to who else was in the car in the exactly, team. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know, I say, no handbook, but if you've got enough desire and you're willing to go and fight for it, I think most people will get surprised at what they can achieve if they keep pushing. Mm. Yeah. It just makes a lot of sense because actually going back to the whole like dyslexic thing, actually, you're you're trying to make what other people understand as easy as possible to digest because that's what I guess that's why like, we have ingest information as well. And I think that's quite interesting between like racing and you know being dyslexic. There are, like I say, unorthodox routes to get in, and it's like your brain's kind of figuring that out as it goes. And I guess I don't know if that's a I don't know a way that it kind of resonates with you actually. You know, because you're un- unconditional thinking. Actually, the way you've got done it and where you've been able to give feedback back to the teams is quite valuable. It's a different, almost unique skill set. Yeah, I, I think maybe, you know, I'm not saying that it's uh, some kind of superpower or something. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, kind of maybe from my side of things, it's actually like, I'm going to explain it in this way yeah. because that's the way that I understand. You know, so it's like, mm. right, it's doing this, this and this. And, and I think like what, People with dyslexia get also are you know, quite prone to sometimes is like maybe like some repetition mm. because like it sort of starts to build up a bit of a, a database yeah so for me like if I did 10 laps you know I'd recall all 10 laps and then I'd be able to say yeah on lap four in Stoke Corner the uh, car did this and then I changed this and then the car did that the following laps and da, 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 da. so my recollection was good yeah but at the same point, you know, the actual sort of analysing and putting it in layman's terms, which is what I needed to do for me mm. and anything else, seemed to be quite uh, well received. And, you know, that, uh, that stood me in good stead because, um, you know, test driver at Williams, test driver at uh, McLaren, um, done quite a lot of test work with, you know, several other manufacturers as well. And then being able to come through and do the race on Sunday afternoon to get some results, you know, it's been a good combination. But... Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't put it down to anything else other than being, you know, fortunate and lucky, and also sort of using what I did have available to me to make the best of. Yeah, and speaking of that Williams, you know, that Williams testing seat, how did that come about? And from I know, because is it, are these things just you have to go and find it? You have to be actively looking for it, or does this come from a relationship you've made earlier on in the career as well? No, it came from a, a relationship that I had with the the Middlebridge F three thousand team, um, which at the that stage was run by a guy called John McDonald, mm. who had his own Formula One team previously called um, Ram, I think it was called then the F1 team. And, uh, you know, of course, and John had several contacts. And I think John was in a situation where he was looking at me and going like, yeah, okay, like, I think we've got some potential here. Alongside me being a factory driver at Nissan in the World Sports Car Championship. And, you know, with John's help and guidance, uh, he called up Frank Williams and said, yeah. like, I really want you to, to meet this kid. Um, you know, meet with him, see whether you think he's got anything there that, you know, is, is going to excite you. And, you know, luckily for me, Frank gave me an opportunity. It may have started only on an airfield, just going up and down in a straight line, yeah. but it built very quickly from that. And you're getting paid for to this at the point? Or is yeah, like- I was quite lucky. I, I managed to get some salary out of it, which was very small, but it was irrelevant. The experience mm-hmm. was way beyond that, but it was nice to be in a situation where I was actually doing it and being paid because for me that's kind of like the, you know, the definition of being professional. Um, uh, and I've always tried to do that. It's like, you know, yeah, I can do this. I know I'm not bad at it, but if you want me, you're going to have to like, pay for it because that's that's my job yeah yeah i don't have anything else to rely on so i'm afraid you know if you do want me to do what i need to do then i'm gonna have to get paid it's important though, too, i guess at that point you know realize your self-worth not that it's wasn't there before but actually you know at this point getting i'm getting paid to this because i'm guessing driving for factory teams you know in car in racing cars sports cars will you get paid for that or was that like if you win basis no no paid paid as well yeah. um but i think maybe some of that kind of like request to get paid was also driven off the back of I was already a father at 21 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, so I hadn't made it to Formula One. I was still progressing as a international racing car driver. So, you know, I was quite driven in, you know, responsibility. I now had 
you know, my he's my eldest boy, obviously, at this mm. point, but like, I had this little young lad there that I was responsible for, and I needed to make sure there was, like, food on the table. So that was really quite, you know, how can I put, like, a, a driving point on my side to keep pushing, 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 and bullshit, confident enough, whatever, to go and yeah. ask to say, look, yeah, I, I, I can do that, but you're going to have to pay me because I needed it. At some point, also made me, made me think in a different way because I needed to go and do what the deal was best for me as a family as opposed to doing maybe what was best for me in terms of career. Um, so, you know, there was a couple of points where I could have probably done a different, you know, navigation point of career, but, you know, the opportunity was and I felt it was right at the time to go and take it. So, yeah, I'm not saying it was always the best one on track performance, but it might have actually been more lucrative at the time. Looking back, yeah, you probably would have done things a little bit differently, but at the same point, you know, needs must. Circumstances sometimes overtake and you've got to do what's best. Yeah, let's say hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah, you could have, you could yeah. have made decisions yeah. earlier on, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Wish, I wish there was a crystal ball for a lot of things, <laughs> but there isn't, yeah. But another thing about, like, obviously doing some research, like, you've not really had, I guess, a management in your career. You just kind of followed, it's what you think's best, and that, or was, was there always people helping you along the way as um, well? So I, I've had... I've had a couple of people that have been on the journey with me in terms of mm-hmm. trying to give me some guidance, um, you know, outside of family and friends. But family and friends have never really had experience of what I was involved in and where I was heading to. So that's always been a little bit tricky. Mm-hmm. But the guys that were around me, you know, on, on part of the journey, always – for me, never really sort of made best choices for what was going to be right for me going forward. And to an extent, that's why I kind of ended up in the management business, and, yeah. you know, looking after uh, driving talent because, you know, I can understand what they're going through and I can hopefully have best interests on their side, put first and, and navigate their careers. Um, but, you know, it's, it's an incredibly difficult pathway. And as I say, maybe decisions what were taken weren't the right ones, like, you know, if I'd have stayed at Williams Formula One team because I held a multi-year contract in my hand, mm. um, maybe the chance of me being a world champion could have been a lot higher than what it uh, would have been with the choices I made. Because you know, I could have stayed at Williams. I wanted me to stay, but I didn't. But I didn't stay because I was doing such a good job at Williams. I got noticed by a Formula One team called Brabham, yeah. and they offered me a seat as a paid Formula One driver. And I thought all my Christmases had come at once. Hindsight, as you just mentioned, is a wonderful thing. If I'd have known the outcome, I would have stayed at Williams. Yeah. But, but I didn't. So that's the way the cookie crumbles, you know? And uh, history is history now, and, and it's been written. No, I think one of your, I guess, one of your first clients, Damon Hill. <laughs> you, if, you, if you want to put it that way, you found it, you found him a seat, and he's, you know, he went I, off to do what he did. But I, I think I was already in the management business because yeah. I called Damon because he was a buddy, and I said, Damon, I'm out of Williams. There's a seat there. You need to get to, you know, down to Didcot Doing and get a favor, deal yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, he probably owes me a commission. Think about it. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> bring him up, <laughs> ask him about it. No, but um, Mark, when you when when you got the first seat and you're like, cool, I'm now you know a paid, not just F1 driver, but you know I'm going to race the race. When you like first out of the car, what were you thinking? What was the sort of like? Right, here we go. I'm here. You know, lights about to go green. Or- um, I mean, listen, I mean, I'm not going to say it wasn't hugely exciting because it was, and it was like all my, you know, dreams come true. But I always looked at it as, you know, the cockpit of a race car was my office. That was my day job. So I was quite focused on, right, let's try and understand what we're going to achieve and what we're going to get out of this. Um, bearing in mind that, you know, as I said to you, I was – a young dad with a family and that responsibility was there, but I was also trying to put everything on the line to go and push on to the next stage. Probably in some respects, never sort of in the right place at the right time. So if you sort of took a little bit of a, you know, where my Formula One career was concerned, I'm not quite in a great race car at the right time to go and do what I could do. Although I've proven it several times when I was in a testing opportunity with with the big teams. So, you know, it was a little bit about trying to push on, push on. I never managed to stay in, in one team for more than the season. And some of that was driven off the back of didn't have the fiscal support with big sponsors behind me. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the teams, for example, like a Tyrrell were then fiscally hampered and needed a, a driver from a different nationality that had big budget and sponsors. Mm. 
Um, you know, certain things that just didn't fall into line, but that, that's just the way it is, you know. I, I don't look back with any regrets. I look forward all the time, so that's just my nature. But, yeah. Um, well, if you keep looking back at all the bad things, you never, you won't be happy with where you are now. And then nah, it's a, it's it's a, it's a, it's a life's too short cycle. for that. Life's too short. You need to keep looking forward. You know, it's great to look back and and reflect and and say, yeah, yeah, we've done that and wonderful. But um, I don't think you know what's gone on in life should dictate what goes on in life going forward. So yeah, you know, it's um, yeah, no, it's it, fantastic times. Brilliant. Wouldn't change them for the world. Um, you know, were there things that I could have done better? 100%. Um, you know, could I maybe have been a bit more ballsy and selfish and, you know, a bit more cutthroat? Yes. Would I have slept as well at night? Probably not because it's not in my nature. So, mm. you know, as I say, there are certain things that, you know, could always be done better, but it's more under the bridge now. Yeah. They're, uh, they're way down the road. I'm always that variety that you know everything happens for a reason you know maybe if you take taken the Williams seat you might not have won Le Mans so there's that you know there might have been a stipulation of the contract you might not have seen or read and then actually all of a sudden you can't go race in France you're stuck in England racing so that's all you know great but you know, the Brabham thing yeah we understand it wasn't a great car and stuff and you know you could have probably had a better performance if you did sell Williams but actually you know moving through your career what is I guess your main decision being your family I guess or what you can do to support them yeah, I think it's been a key driver for me always. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, and yet, whatever the fact is, it's a consideration. You've got to make sure that, you know, there is the understanding that, you know, I'm, it's not just all about me. It's, mm. there's, there's more than me in the equation. Um, so, yeah, that has been a, a key driver. But not putting that up as any excuse or anything no, that would have changed the way that I went about things. I don't think that would be right one little bit. But... You know, it's um, it's definitely had a, a, an outcome in terms of some decisions made, as I said to you, right or wrong. But it's also been a real positive for me that I've used that as, you know, my hunger factor has mm. always been driven off the back of it, yeah. uh, as it is still today. Um, I don't think any differently in terms of what I do when I get up every morning and I like, focus on the, the day ahead. It's still with the same drive and, uh, you know, understanding of like putting the day's work in and getting something out the end of it and, feeling good about that and rewarded and hopefully progressing. Um, and I'm old school, you know, for me, every day's a school day, so mm. never stop learning. Yeah. And obviously, obviously through the F1 career, you've met so many people, but actually I'm interested in, you know, for instance, for you, who stood out the most and what, what did they teach you? It was like, was Ron Dennis a big thing, I guess, or Nathan Senna or even, you know, Frank Williams. What did you learn from these people? Uh, listen, I think every, every person that you meet, there's always something you take away, mm. good, bad or indifferent. Um, you know, there's there's lots of little nuggets of information that you sort of glean from people. But yeah, I like certain drivers. I've learned a huge amount. Teammates have learned a huge amount. Team bosses. Um, you know, Ron Dennis, for example, like always. You know, when we were discussing things, said like, if you're going to have a situation where you get into a contractual relationship, then you know, always try and generate a contract. Yeah, you know, and, I, and I'm kind of looking at it and going, well, that's expensive because it costs quite a lot of money to get a contract done, mm. you know, with lawyers. Yeah. But, you know, the point being was, well, yeah, that's correct. But actually, nine times out of ten, if you generate a contract, you normally get the contract to go in your favor in many areas as opposed to not. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's that been quite a true, you know, uh, sort of bit of advice that we still use today within our business. So, you know, it's cost me a lot of money with lawyers over the years, but it's been uh, quite well received. Is that something you, um, I guess, encourage racing drivers to do nowadays is to write their own contracts up when they're going to team? Was that something that it's harder to do because they're dealing with? Well, I think when you get to a certain point, it's difficult to get to uh, get to that stage um, because, you know, for me to turn around to something like McLaren, so, oh, by the way, we're going to generate our own contract. This uh, is what makes it hard to, yeah. Yeah. But in certain other partnerships and relationships, you know, whether that be endorsements, sponsorships, that kind of thing, then we would definitely try and apply that. Um, and also, you know, the, the drivers would expect us to be looking after them on that side, so you know, which we do. So that's that's really one of our jobs. Yeah. And so when someone's coming to you, I guess, were you looking for anything from the driver themselves in particular about, you know, that, that spunk or they they coming to you as like a... Um, 
Well, I mean, driver wise, listen, uh, for me, you know, uh, guys, girls, there's got to be a bit of a twinkle in the ride. There's got to be something that just sort of like makes them stand out. Mm. You know, and at the end of it, all the stopwatch never lies. You know, if they're quick, you know, that's to be on end all for me as a racing driver. You know, it's it's then, you know, they can do a lap, now can they do 20, yeah. you know, and can they make it count? Um, but, uh, you know, modern day drivers have got to be so much more than just going around and doing a the lap. They've got to be the, the politician, they've got to be the CEO, they've got to be the financial director, you know, um, they've got to be their own PR person. They've got to handle all these little facets that go into being complete. And you know, that's the part for me that they all have to learn. And sometimes it takes a bit longer, sometimes it doesn't, but I think it's very important that they do learn it because mm. we're in such a sort of, uh, almost like what I call like a swipe world, you know, today. It's like instant that sometimes things get missed out. Yeah, And I think when you miss those out, when things go a bit pear-shaped and you've got to dig deep, there's nothing there to lean on and sort of draw upon to go, oh, yeah, actually I've been through here before and I understand it and I need to do this to get out of it. So you, know, you sometimes see that in driver careers where they've got there so quickly and then it doesn't quite work the following season maybe and then they really struggle to find themselves and pick themselves back up. Yeah, because yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a victim of that. Great, I'll just speak to people. people. I'll, I'll just, just, you know, know, I'll, I'll Tell the camera, yeah, there was no research, research there, was there was no sort of like, like you know, what works good, good. Uh, how, how to talk to people, people. Uh, what do I even do on camera, camera. Like, is there anything I need to do? do? I, from the first three or four podcasts I recorded, the same thing, I guess it might be the same thing for race drivers as well. First race they do, they completely forget how to do everything because they've not had the, you know, they've had the seat time, they've had discipline to actually go, you know, not not quick dip, not quick dopamine, you know, release from swine, I guess, but yeah, they're not prepared. Yeah, and I think you have to remember that, you know, all the people you meet on the way up, you meet on the way down. So, so you know, that's, you know, that's, that's what I try and say to people. It's like, you know, don't have to close every door behind you and, you know, and go on the basis of it's never going to be open again. Yeah. You know, uh, life's quite funny. It will uh, go full circle on you quite a lot of times. So, you know, um, for me, it's all about making sure that, you know, relationships, partnerships are ones that have got depth attached to them. And, uh, you know, you know, hopefully they will stand you in good stead in the future. And, and that future might not involve going around in circles anymore, um, but it might involve going around in circles for somebody else and you're still part of that process. So, you know, that's, that's been something that's been beneficial for us in our business today. Yeah, where did you learn that from? from? So so interesting. Sort of, yeah, just, just kind of dig it out. out. Like dad taught you. No, I think that would be, that would be one uh, big thing from my late father that, you know, always big in terms of, Treat people with, you know, respect, and and if you do, you'll get respect back. Um, please and thank you cost nothing, so it's really easy one to remember. And yeah. People for, you know, tend to forget, and yeah, I think um, you know, don't put nothing in, you don't get nothing out. It, you know, they're all sort of cliche sort of quotes, but they work. Yeah. You know? So if you uh, if you want to apply them, I think you know you can you can do. Yeah, no worse than what you're doing at that point in time without applying them. But you know, I think if you do, you'll get a little bit more out. Yeah, because yeah, in your, your really starting start racing career, career you're towards the end of it, or you're in the middle of it. You know, no, the biggest is you, you may hate you treat people, but remember, like, like if, for instance, I know someone treats you quite short and sharp, they want things from you. It's very easy to you know forget about that person pretty quickly. Yeah, I think yes, I mean you as you go through life and as you get older, you kind of. You know, you know, it's, it's quite, quite true, true that, that actually your 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 well world sort of expands, and then I think as you get older, it kind of shrinks again. Mm -hmm. But it's also aligned with you know what your appetite is as well. So you know, we get lots of things that come our way in terms of you know opportunities and approaches. But there's only so many hours in a day. So you know, at that point, you need to make sure that what you're doing is you know what you want to do and what you do best, and actually what you think is going to be most beneficial. And, and I say that in terms of, you know, what's most beneficial for the business. And you know, as much as I might want to go down some pathway and look at the opportunity, maybe it's not best served for me to be doing so. But as you get a bit older and more experienced, you get a bit more disciplined in saying no. You know, because that's quite hard for people, saying the word no. But it's also something that I'm quite, you know, positive around I'm, I'm not I don't have any harm of uh, of saying that to anyone you know I don't, I don't sort of step back and sort of like go sorry but no I'm like no but no in a way we've like it's no because it's not good for you it's not good for us 
Um, so, so, you know, best we don't waste each other's time on it because we're going to crack on and do something different. Yeah. And speaking, speaking of the word no, I guess there are there opportunities, opportunities that you wish you said no to, looking back. Anything you thought, actually, I could have done, done without that. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably going to grab, grab him in the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but there, but you, there go. you go. Uh, you know, there, there are, are things like that. But as I say, I, I won't. I don't dwell on things like that. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'd rather just keep going forward. So I just, I just think, think as you get a little bit older, older and a bit more experience attached, attached you know. You know can't, can't always, always say yes, yes and keep trying, trying to please everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's impossible. impossible. Yeah. yeah, and, and what, what happens, happens is if you keep, keep trying, trying to do it, it you just put expectations beyond, beyond you know your capabilities, capabilities and then everybody, everybody else's, else's, and all you get at the end of it is uh, disappointment. So, so you know it's better off just to kind of like you know keep things in check yeah. and yeah. do what you're comfortable with, and, and at the same point deliver it to the best of your capabilities because you know like on track. And in, and in business, business mm-hmm. you're counting on your delivery. And, and that delivery is results, basically. So, you know, that's that's what you'll be known for and that's what you'll get your results driven off the back of in terms of your profitability or in terms of whether you're standing on top of the podium, whether you're standing third or whether you've got a DNF. You know, it's, it's all about delivery. And so, and so when you start getting to back F1, F1 you move to, 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 to television, yeah. when, 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 when that came out, out what was your thoughts behind it? Do you think this is another option? Do you think this is another day of office? office? Or was it going to try for the first time? Um, honestly, at the point that that came about, I kind of, I was in America at the time and I did a couple of bits and pieces standing in for Martin Brundle. And I sort of stood alongside Murray Walker and I did some commentary and, well, actually, yeah, this is kind of fun. And, the opportunity, the opportunity in the door opened, opened and I thought, yeah, yeah it's kind of going to fit for where I am career-wise yeah. now. So I grasped it and sort of, you know, seven years down the line, um, it did what we did. Again, was I the most eloquent guy? No. You know, did I get things wrong? Yes. Um, was I ever trained to be a media person? Or No. And did I enjoy it? Yes. So all of these things, but I said it. How, how I understood it, it. and, and you know, time, time and time again, again, I think people you know, would comment, comment to me and go, "Oh, yeah, I've got what you were saying." You didn't overcomplicate it, because yeah, uh, so if it had been complicated, I wouldn't have got it either. Um, but, you, so, know, you know, that, 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 that's, that's, that's something, something that's just that's took on board as being something that I had the opportunity to do, and it was live TV. I mean, we were going out to some big audiences back on ITV television, then with Grand Prix, sometimes hitting seven or eight million. You know, you know, on a Sunday, Sunday evening. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah uh, again, again, no no, no regrets. regrets. Would, Would I like, like to still do some, some things? things? Yeah, yeah, now and again, I look at it and go, oh, it'd be nice to do something on TV, TV but actually, actually, I'm really busy anyway. So <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not the end of the world. Wouldn't fit the schedule. Yeah. yeah. That's 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 many people, people, people. people. Oh, you look at it. Yeah. Was, that, was, was the pressure, pressure different, different? I guess in a race car, car or was it the same as getting on the TV? Um, like, like, like television, television has always, always got pressure. pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and a little bit like if you get it wrong in a corner and you say something wrong, it's gone. That's the end of it. You can't bring it back. So yeah, there is some there is some pressure there, but it wasn't quite the same. I mean, you know, if I fluff my words or Said, said something that was the wrong way around because you, know, you know that's the way my brain was wired. Um, so, so be it. it. But you know, if I hit a barrier or hit a concrete wall, consequences, consequences could be a lot worse. So you know it wasn't quite the same as driving a Grand Prix. No. But yeah, I think it, it, it was good grounding and it gave me a great insight. And many of it, you know, like it's been kind of cool to do several different things career-wise you know maybe all connected to motorsport in many ways but it's been nice to sort of be on one side of the camera than the other um, and I again I can look back with fond memories yeah it's, it's not a you're not a plan like a career I'm going to be a racing driver I'm going to be a pundit it's not like you know footballers are going to be a footballer I'm going to be a pundit and then I'm going to go start a podcast whatever I want to do it's essentially just got quite kind of the flow yeah I do not think there's been any planning connected with my journey in life let alone my career so yeah I don't know I think you know again I think a lot of it is driven by desire enthusiasm passion determination um, if you've got some interest I think that will help you in terms of where you want to navigate but yeah never never actually went out and said I'm going to be a TV pundit it entered my head it was something that 
Because yeah. yeah. it's, 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 it's not a crypto thought I've got on. I've stuttered massively, massively, massively in school. My, my speech is awful. And actually, you know, you're doing this, it's terrifying. If you went to 18 and Harry and you're going to go speak to people with a camera in your face. I've got to touch the around. But it's weird, I guess. You know, you take your children, they're in front of you. Life kind of just has a funny way of picking things up and challenging you as well. Yeah, yeah, but I think at the end of the day, day if you've got something you're passionate, passionate about, which you clearly are, are, and you're able, able to, you know, see, see the rewards when you put it all together, and it gives you a bit of confidence. Uh, and I think confidence is something that people sometimes like don't put enough emphasis on, and and have enough value attached to it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, it isn't about. That's one, one of my, my staff coming to the door, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's planned. You just saw my face. Right? Um, <laughs> um, I, think it's, yeah. I think it's, you know, I think it does, it does help when people have got a level of confidence. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, because you know, listen, you if you don't have it, no one else is going to give it to you. You know, you've got to actually like bring it from within and then put it out, out there. But at the same point, point yeah, yeah I, think I think when you start, start to build a bit of confidence, you start to function at a level that, you know, blossoms. Mm-hmm. Um, no different to where you are today. Like, you probably wouldn't have as you've been exactly doing all that. Here, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So, you can you explain know, that. But, but it, like your confidence has given you that, you know, yeah. to come and do it. So, hats off. Well, well done. No, thank you. It's, it's, it's one of those where it's like, like if one, one, one not time is yeah, then we've got nothing to lose. lose. You know, you know, like I said, people are jumping nicer, nicer than you think they're, they're going to be to you, you. as well. So, I, I, I think, think that's a very uh, uh, wise head there with that kind of uh, outlook because, and, and a lot of people are, you know, especially youngsters coming through in our area of motorsport, I say to them, I say like, you know, just, just go and ask. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, you'll be surprised, you know, how people respond. Um, and some, some people are like, oh, I can't go and ask her. Well, what have you got to lose? Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, people get people to approach us all the time. They go, listen, look, I can't, I can't help you no. in terms of where you're trying to get to because it's not quite going to like align where we are. But if I can give you 15 minutes, 30 minutes of my time to try and help you go on the pathway, no issue. Happy to do so. But they've got to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because one thing I, 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 again, again, I'm not going to put the book in everyone's eyes. We had this, we had this, had this, had this conversation, had this conversation had once before. before. We've already had this. And I, you know, some things didn't work out. I thought, what's the harm in asking again? Right? What's the You know, worst thing you go, no, 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 cool. I'll publish myself basically 50 minutes the other side of the conversation. But this hasn't been a conversation about your career. So I guess the more what you've learned, and what I love about this is that no one's going to hear the same. In 1992, I did this. In 1994, I did this. In 1996, I did this. And actually, people know that it's eight, eight podcasts. They've got that information in it. And I'd rather give them to them that haven't heard as well. Yeah, I mean, probably about two podcasts, but I don't think I've even done that many, Harry. Yeah, so don't worry. But no, you're right. And and to be really open, um, as I say, yeah, it's great to look back, but I kind of like, it's been there, done that. So that chapter's like closed. Yeah. Um, for me, it's like, right, what's the next chapter and what are we looking at and how are we going to put, you know, the finishing touches to the book, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to close it all out. And that's really where I am now. Writing a book, are we? Or? Well, I mean, <laughs> chapter of life and book of life, maybe, you know, but um, I'm 57, so 58 this year. And you know, I'm like, for me, my big focus point is succession inside the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're only a small business, but already it's like, right, how, how do I start aligning people in terms of like, you know, taking the business forward and growing it? And for me, that's a huge amount of interest and also really rewarding. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of where my focus is in, in today's world. And that's what drives me every day to get up and do what we do. I was going to say, because, you know, that, that, that seeing it as a day job in the office, in the office every day. Is there, is there, I guess, for you, what drives you to... Do it more. Is it, is it the kids still, or is it is there a, a, is there a different? Are you trying to uh, like grow the MVP name? Yeah, yeah. My, my, my kids, kids are men now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they can't still be. Maybe the grandkids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, what what drives is it's like everything. You know, for me, it's like you go out there and do a qualifying lap. You know, I, I align that, and I have a lot of parallels of what I did back in sport, in mm-hmm. sport, in terms of our look at business. You know, so for me, it's like right. How do we get the most performance out of what we've got available to us? How do we maximize it? 
Yeah. You know, how do we increase our profitability? How do we increace our efficiency? Yeah. 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 How are we more you know, time efficient? Yeah. Uh, and also, how do we all have fun? Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, am, am, am I doing what's best for all of us? You know, are we all enjoying what we're doing? Because ultimately, if you're not, what's the point? You know, there isn't. You know, and I think sometimes that gets missed on people's like, if you want to get the best out of people, you know, try and make it. You know, I'm not saying that everyone's got to go around laughing their heads off, yeah. but let's try and just make some experience throughout the day an enjoyable one. Uh, and, and one where there's some teamwork and one that we can all look at the end of the week and go, yeah, we can choose this together. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and hopefully that's something that's instilled in everyone who works with us in our small little agency. And, you know, and year on year we've been getting not necessarily bigger, but we've been getting better. Yeah, you know, for me that's, that's that's good that's good progress yeah. and when you say better, better what do you mean by better in terms of like the, the, the efficiency is it all you talk about the profitability what you talk about better you talk about all of those yeah. uh, parameters yeah. you know the business, business is, is growing, growing in terms of profitability the business is growing in terms of debt for people um, it's growing in terms of our output what we actually can do in house and what we do to look after several of our, our drivers our corporate clients you know, we're, we're quite, quite um, how can I put it? We're quite small, but we like we punch well above our weight. So, you know, I quite like that. Great power to weight ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I quite like being the like the little underdog guy that, you know, actually, yeah, we can do that. And actually, we can do it quite well. You know, so like, oh, well, yeah, we might not be sort of the big agency, you know, global, but um, yeah, we can hold our own. Um, and I, I quite like that. Yeah, yeah. So if I was to say MVP at its best, 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 three to five years, you'd be you know, operating at that point. Does that have a certain earmarkers? Is there a certain sport you want to be in? Is there a certain amount of drives you want to be about? Or is it more just growing it to more of what you said earlier about being that? I think from the driver side, you know, even though we've been around it for probably now, what, 18 years, and we've been really close, we still haven't had a driver on our books that's in Formula One. Um, we've been test drivers and yeah, reserves so that would be nice to have that and put a ribbon around it and go right we've done that um, in terms of where we are with the, the agency and other areas I think we've got huge amounts of potential to grow and you know our, our digital marketing side our corporate network our event side they are doing that year on year and, and yeah, yeah, okay, it might, it might not be what I did on a Sunday afternoon 25, 25 years ago, but um, it's, it's equally rewarding and it's equally uh, equally rewarding as well to see, you know, members of the team growing as well, you know, and, and coming to the table with ideas and you know, productivity increasing. So that's, that's a different dynamic. It's a different, you know, for me, it's like I come in as a CEO of the business um, but you know, it doesn't always mean to say that I'm there like taking leadership in yeah, these different areas. I'm quite lucky that we've got a great team who are, you know, definitely throughout the week teaching me a thing or two. Um, just hopefully I'm keeping them on the straight and narrow so they don't go off and you know diminish our profitability. <laughs> yeah. That's what's in my shoulders. No, it's always great because you, you, you can't be here all the time. You can't be. You know, you, you want. You want to be here all the time. You want to be here all the time. You know, you're willing, willing to, to you know, put that put time and invest with other people as well. well. It's great because you know, they're going to be what's, what's going, going forward. forward. You, know, you, you won't you always be here, but you might be. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I'm, um, you know, style-wise, I would say like I'm a micromanagement guy. Mm-hmm. I'm like, uh, okay, there's, there's the opportunity. There's a blank canvas. Now, you know, you've got accountability, you've got responsibility. Not to say that you're going to get things wrong. But, but, you know, I'm going to give you all of that to go away, away with. Never, never be shy to come through the door and ask. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I say it to everyone, and if you asked anybody in this building, they will say the same thing. You know, I will go, never assume anything. So I kind of put them with that, but I give them a little bit to keep thinking about. Yeah. But, you know, it's, um, it's, as I say, it's really great to see people blossom inside the organization. And, and we're a young workforce, you know. I think outside, outside of my PA will kill me for saying it. Outside, outside of myself and my PA, all of our guys and girls who are here are under the age of 30. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, we're really like, you know, pushing on with a young workforce. And um, 
and they're doing a tremendous job. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we're going to the end, end Mark, and this has been a you know, yeah, fascinating yeah, for me, if anything, anything to, just to, to, to get, get to know how your brain works. works but, um, five, five questions, questions I have. have and, uh, the first one is, what was your ultimate three car garage? Ultimate three car garage. Good question. So I would... I would, I would definitely, definitely say that, that in, my in my garage, garage would be my original Formula Ford 1600 Lola, Lola. Yeah. Yeah. 644E, um, because that's where it all started, so that would have to be in there. Then I would probably go to my ultimate road car as a kid and the dream machine, which was an Audi Quattro nice. with yeah. a digital dash. It was all the rage back then. Um, so I definitely would have one of those there. And and then after that, I'd, I'd actually uh, I'd kick myself for selling it, but I managed to acquire a Ferrari, an, an F12. Oh, lovely, yeah. And, and I have to say, it's one of the most enjoyable road cars that I've, I've had. Um, and I regret selling it. And, uh, yeah. That would definitely be in my garage, even though it's an old model now, but it would, it would be there because it was uh, something that put a smile on your face. I, I can see the uh, physical <laughs> regret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> no, no. Um, no, no, it's, no, it's a great, great three car garage. It's, it's nice, nice to have a bit of everything in the not actually nice. to pin, pin yourself down to having. I have to have three, three suits. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, and then as well as got one car to drive or race on any road or track, but you know, at once, where would you go? What would you take? Uh, uh, so, so circuit wise would probably be Spa, Spa Francorchamps and, and I'm pretty sure, sure that would be in all drivers top three tracks, tracks around the world and uh, bizarrely it would probably be a car that I never raced interesting it would be an Williams FW14B that I had the uh, privilege of testing on two occasions even though I was a race driver at Brabham, Formula One team, Williams asked me to go back and do some test work for them. Even while Damon was there, which yeah, he'll probably bite his lip when he hears me say that. Um, and that for me was probably the most complete and well balanced Formula One car I've ever driven. Mm-hmm. So I would have loved to take that round Spa and uh, yeah, see see what that had underneath it. Yeah. Have you ever asked, asked to do that? Yeah. No, 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 I don't think it will, it will ever happen, happen. But, you know, so, so uh, I'm rather than ask, uh, I won't put myself in a position of being disappointed when I get told no. So, yeah, yeah I won't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, and, Mark, what do you what think, you think the, purpose the purpose is, you know, when it comes to your career? What, 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 what gets you out of bed? Yes. Uh, uh, listen, I think what gets me out of bed is just self motivation, just to, you know, to try and build something and be proud of it. And, and, and at the end, end of it, you know, I think having, having a bit of drive and producing something that you can see some you know, end result. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter what that actually is, but you know, inside our business today, we do several things and you know, nine times out of ten, there's an end result that you see and you can look at it and go, yeah, that's, that's, that's good or bad. But, you know, if it's, if it's bad, then let's understand why and improve upon it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not driven by money. I'm not driven by getting out of bed doing 200 miles an hour anymore. I'm just, I'm driven by, you know, actually getting out and, and doing something that, you know, produces an end result. But hopefully on the way, we've all enjoyed ourselves and we've all delivered to whoever it may be, whether it's our world champion, Mike Conway, that we've managed for 18 years or whether it's our corporate bank client. Yeah, you know that we come to the end of it and they go thanks, thanks guys that, that's, that's, that's a good job done yeah, yeah. that for me is a uh, high standard cake I guess making, it's making a difference in people's lives I guess is a really good but yeah and again this podcast I keep telling people this I mean it's here to show you what's possible for your humility and where you want to take it to where you want today but what advice would you give to young Mark just starting out maybe 18 years old what would you give to young Mark just starting out maybe 18 years old I think, I think a little bit of what we touched on hmm. is just, uh, you know, never be afraid to ask. Um, don't give up, you know, because you're going to hear no a lot of your, you know, a lot of the times in your career you're going to hear no. Um, but, you know, keep throwing enough mud at the wall, some will stick. So, you know, just, um, and, I, and I think, honestly, it's just, as I said earlier, please and thank you goes a long way you'd be surprised how far it goes yeah. and, and it costs nothing and don't forget it. 
And, and yeah, 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 Mark, the, the last question is, um, what do you love most about motorsport? Um, um, what, what I, I love most about motorsport? I think, I think actually for me, it would just be like man and machine. That was always the ultimate buzz for me is like put yourself into a Grand Prix car and uh, try and you know, extract everything and take it to the limit and beyond. And if you pulled it back, brilliant. That was the buzz. And to this day, you know, even though I might not get in a Grand Prix car, I still rattle around now and again when uh, somebody allows me to. Um, and that's still about the same sort of feeling. It's like, yeah, put yourself in that environment, going beyond the limit and bringing it back. If you don't bring it back, probably don't show up to the paddock because you're not going to get a welcome. There's plenty of videos of people not bringing it back, so. <laughs> and they know what you mean as well. Um, no, but Mark, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for letting me into your lovely office as well. It's been a messy office because we're busy. People can't see it. It's fine. They can't see all the stuff that we move around. Yeah, that's what you're saying. They're lovely, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you very much.